the Lord, Hawaii, what a gorgeous, gorgeous day. Doesn't it make you feel good that you're alive and God gave you life and gave you a body to live in? Do you ever think about that? You're just a spirit with this little body covering and you're looking out, you're peering out through your eyes and that spirit is eternal. Once it hits God's spirit and you get God's spirit through his son Jesus Christ, you and I are eternal spirits, eternal beings. Well, wait till that lovely siren goes by. You know, life can be full of lots of ups and downs and emergencies like that siren is going into emergencies and times of, you wonder, what's happening? What's happening in your life? And you get a little confused and, you know, today, my dear darling, Catherine, I'm going to give the word first. Is that all right? We move by the Holy Spirit. You know, I find that if we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way, he will not always do it our way. He loves to come in and surprise us and do it his way. His way is always better. At least I found that out. We have a lovely pastor here today, and I'm sure he agrees with me because he's an Assembly of God pastor. And like me, he's been in Pentecost perhaps many, 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 many years, although he's a young man. And we've learned, if anything, to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit because Jesus only did the will of the Father. He never got into any trouble, folks. If I would just learn to move in the will of the Father and speak in the will of the Father and be the attitude, you know those beatitudes? Not the matitudes, the beatitudes. Be what Jesus wants me to be. I would be in a lot less hot water lot less trouble. As I was having my little breakfast this morning, I noticed the waitress peeking over my shoulder as I was writing this out. <laughs> she was reading it. I didn't mind. I thought, that's good. She's curious, and it's all right. I like to, you know, as I'm writing a little word, this is a little, my little paper napkin prophecy for you. It's a word from the Lord, from the dear Holy Spirit who's here in the earth to comfort you and exhort you and edify you. He came through his Holy Spirit to me, to you. And it always is speaking to me. All prophecy speaks to all of us. It doesn't just finger out one person, unless that's a personal prophecy. But even then, it can be applicable to others can be applied to other hearts. That's what that word means. Big words, I don't use them very often. I have to learn them from my husband. And then I don't often say them right. But that means that the word of God applies to all hearts, both those who are saved and unsaved. Today, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you very strongly. My child, it's the devil's job to assault your mind. He's very, very busy at this time, chasing down the godly people and harassing the Christians. Hey, he's not just harassing those who don't know the Lord. He is big time stuff now coming after the godly people. Why? Because he knows his time is short very short, very, very, very short, because the Lord is coming back. Revival is coming. Many marvelous things are going to happen with our youth. You know, we have a blessed pastor here with us today. He's going to talk about the youth and his vision of the youth of the islands. And it'll warm your heart. I love seeing the men of God talking about the youth because our young men and our young women are the future. 
As old timers like myself, I'm just here as a mama to encourage you, you young people who are out there, you're going to do all the mighty works of God. And when you come back from doing those mighty works of God, I'll be here just to pat you on the back and Pastor and I and pat you on the back and say, okay, now it's time to rest. You've done the best you could for God. Now come aside and rest and don't burn out. That's what old folks learn, okay? That's what old broads learn like me. I, that's a joke, okay? I'm a, not an old lady, but I'm an old gal, okay? Older. And I don't mind. It's the devil's job to assault your mind. He's very busy at this time, chasing down godly people, harassing Christians, trying to shake their faith, bring doubts and fears, and downright lies to your mind. Yesterday, Pastor, I had a spirit that was following me around, that dirty dog, that rotten, good-for-nothing spirit. It's the only one I can talk about like that is the devil. I never talk about people that way, not even a dog or a cat or a bird, but I sure name that guy Satan and I frame him. Name him and frame him. And I said, this is an oppressive spirit following me around and I don't like it. And you know, you have to get your armor on and start to fight and get your sword out of the word and stick him. Tell him, get off my back, you monkey. Get out of here. <laughs> and when you do that, you know, I even had to call my pastor and say, you know, there's a spirit lying to me and blah, 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 blah. Now pray for me. Where you can't get it off your own back, get somebody else, two in his agreement, get it off your back. Mm. I call Catherine and she gets them off my back all the time. Those little monkeys that wrap their tails around my neck and choke me. And, and I didn't expect to say this this morning, but anyway. And they put their little fingers in my ear so I can't see or hear. You know, put their hands around your eyes so you can't see. Those are monkeys on your back. Could be drugs could be adultery, could be addictions, could be anything that tries to wrap around young people. That kind of music that just makes you blind and deaf, makes me deaf anyway, that loud music. Uh, again, I'm an old lady, so that's hard for me. That's right. But you know, devil's got some music hatched right up out of hell, and I don't like it. I like the heavenly music that comes down, swimming down around and brings you peace of mind. Back to the you know, he's trying to shake your faith, bring doubts and fears and downright lies to your mind. He will steal your peace of mind, your joy in the spirit. Yeah, he stole my joy, the dirty, good-for-nothing, rotten, stinking devil. He tries to steal your joy of life. And you just got to kick him in the teeth and tell him, no. You just grab your joy that you get when you're at prayer meeting and you get when you're with the godly people and grab it and hold on to it when you go into your house and the kids start screaming at you and your husband starts screaming at you or your wife or whatever or the neighbors start screaming at you because your dog is on their lawn doing you know what. Just grab the joy and say, nothing's going to steal my joy. Nothing's going to steal my peace of mind. You have to almost take it by violence. You almost have to just grab it and hold on to it with all of your might. You have to run after peace. That's what the Word says. He will try to steal your peace of mind, your joy in the Spirit, and even cause you to feel slighted and hurt with very dear and precious persons near you that you love. He will pick fights with you and your pastor, you and the pastor's wife, you and your husband, you and your children, you and your best neighbor, you and your best friend. That's his job. That's what the Lord says. It's the devil's job. And he's doing it very well if you allow him to. And you start to gossip and all that junk. You don't want to backbite and gossip. Bite the devil. Take the word of God and just hit him, smack him with the word of God. Tell him, back off, back out of my life. I'm sorry, I'm preaching in between this prophecy this morning. It even caused you to feel slighted or hurt with very dear, near persons you love. He is out to separate friends, break up homes, destroy families. He is up to no good for your life. His purposes are to bring you down and put your soul in hell, period. There ain't no other way I can say it. He's mad as all get out. 
that the godly people are coming into the United States and taking over. In other words, he has tried to ruin our beautiful America with pollution and all kinds of things. Not only pollution in the air and all, but pollution in the spirit. He's tried to pollute and dilute the things of God through New Age and through all of these things that are not of God, and you'd swallow them if you don't know better. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance brings you a lot of trouble, folks. And believe me, I've been ignorant a lot of my life. But when you read the Word of God, it's just so simple a child can understand it. It'll tell you what not to do and what to do. Get the Living Bible. Read over there in Romans 1. It'll tell you all about God's plan for man and how he loves men and women. And he doesn't want you down in the frying pan. He doesn't want you down in the gutter and in the slop with the pigs. He wants you as a royal priesthood to be the king's kid and the king's daughter and the king's son. He's up to no good for your life. His purposes are to bring you down and your soul into hell. But you know better, don't you? We are here to bring life, unity, and peace of mind and purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the Son, and whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. You've been free a long time, didn't even know it. When you got the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in you, you have the three greatest powers in the whole universe dwelling in you. And when you have Christ in you, you have all of God himself, the Word says. Christ in us, the hope of his glory, not ours. Let's get it right, the secret, Jesus Christ in us, his resurrection life and power flowing through us to help us to overcome every day's problems. Brother, sister, you're going to have problems. Satan's after you. Your name is written down on the blackboard of hell. He's telling all the demons to go. Go get so-and-so. Go get this one. This man is standing for God. This family is standing for God. Go get them. Give them as much trouble as you can. And you know what? When Satan goes up before God to accuse us, the Lord says, I've got them covered. I've got them covered. I've already forgiven them. That's my son down there. You get your hands off of him. That's my daughter. You get your hands off of them. Believe me, even your enemies can't hurt you when God is with you. Nothing can be against you. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Because you've forgotten who God is. He's the creator of all earth and heaven and the skies and the seas and the mountains. He's God. We forget who God is. We make God very small when he's God. He's limitless. It's my mind that's small. Jesus Christ, whoever has come into Jesus Christ. The Son has set him free. He is freed indeed. Child of God, cast down and out every vain imagination, every lie. Don't swallow the devil's lie today. He's been lying to you all along the way and you swallowed it and it became a root of bitterness and hurt inside of you. Spit it out, give it to God, forgive it, and let it go of it and let God deal with it. And bless your enemy and bless those who curse you call you all manners of names and will persecute you for the sake of Christ. When you get persecuted and we get persecuted because we lie, we should take the blame. If we've stolen or we've lied, don't put that on Christ. But when you're persecuted for Christ's sake because of standing for the Lord, he will come in like gangbusters. He will come in with his heavenly force of angels and help you to be the man or woman of God and child of God that he's called you to be. He will defend you because he can, because you're standing on solid ground. You're not standing on lies and all that kind of stuff and deception. Don't swallow the lies of the devil and his discouragement. Today, I release you in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive Jesus, receive life, for the wages of sin are death, but the gift of life is the gift of God, is eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart, wash my heart clean, 
wash my mind and my mouth and my ears out too, that I might be presentable, I might hear your voice, Lord, that I might follow after you more nearly and more dearly. I need you, God. I need you, Lord. I need you, Holy Spirit. I said never before. This is a day of war. This is a day of battling. This is a day the enemy is going to seek after your soul to ruin and destroy you. Don't let him. Just look up to God and say, he's after me again. He's on my tail. He's following me with sickness, with all these things. He's after me. Jesus, help. And those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered and saved. Amen. Thank you for listening to that little word. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is right there on the scene with us. Don't you worry if you've been gloomy, do me. It says, for he has delivered us out of the gloom. Christ has delivered us out of the gloom and the doom of Satan's kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of his own dear son, Jesus Christ, who forgave us all of our sins and he bought us with his blood. Mm. Remember, we're bought people. Yes. We're sold out people to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen, sister. Don't you let the devil get you. Get that monkey off your back. I had to yesterday. Thank God I had a pastor who knew how to help me take that monkey off my back and swing it and throw it out into the ocean somewhere. Hey, <laughs> get those monkeys off your back. In Jesus' name. Okay. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I preach and prophesy at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I call that preach teaching. Lots, lots of people preach, but I'll call that preach prophesy teaching. <laughs> what is your miracle a day that keeps the devil away, Catherine? Well, I met this young lady the other day, <clears throat> and um, I was talking to her about different miracles, and she said, oh, wow. She says, my neck hurts. I have headaches all the time. My back is so sore. My husband has to ma massage me every morning because Baby. it's so sore. And so I said, well, it sounds like a spiritual battle. So I said, let's go through a forgiveness, repentance prayer. So she was forgiving all these people, and mainly it was her mother-in-law who would say things that would cut her and wound yeah. her, you know, because yeah. she's tender. Yeah, talking to the and, camera, uh, Catherine. So I um, had her forgive, and I was surprised that um, you know, she was such a sweet girl. Like, you couldn't believe that she was on drugs and drinking, and she had an abortion and all these things. And I thought, whoa, but I had to act very calm, you know, and <laughs> like, it was OK. <clears throat> so anyway, she started crying. And her little girl came, and she saw her crying. So the little girl was crying. I thought, oh, she must think I'm a meanie for making her mother cry. So <laughs> I had to run after her and say, it's OK, it's OK. <laughs> but anyway, after she forgave all these people, I started praying for her. And I checked her leg, and her leg started growing out. And she said, wow, it's stretching, it's stretching. And, and uh, so I said, OK, now you get up and praise the Lord. You get up and walk. And, and uh, so she started dancing around. I was making her uh, praise the Lord. And um, so finally, uh, she says, wow, all the pain's gone. My headache's gone. Everything's gone. She was so happy. And uh, so, so I said, you know what? When you see your mother-in-law, don't think, oh, here she is. She's going to tell me something bad. And I said, no, you just say, um, Oh, this is going to be a good day. My mother-in-law is going to be real nice to me. She's not going to say anything mean to me. And you'd be very positive. And so I just said, OK. So then I, I told her about this lady that had a hard time at work. And she, people would give her such a bad time. I said, now you, before you go in to work, you say, wow, God, thank you, Lord. I'm going to have a wonderful day today. And everybody's going to be so nice. I'm going to have favor and blessing and credibility with everyone. And so that's how you should start your day. Because if we be positive and think good things about people, they'll come back. Because words are like little containers. They go around the world, and they come right back to you. So if you send out good things, it'll come back to you. 
So we all need to realize that our words have such an impact in the world and in our lives. And so um, it was wonderful to see her dancing around and praising the Lord and oh, we're having such a blessed time. <laughs> Kevin, it's great to have mother-in-laws because they train you up for the ministry. <laughs> I remember my mother-in-law saying to me, well, she's gone to heaven now. It's none of my business, but, and I would wait for that but, you know, when they, it's none of my business, but, and I think, uh-oh, oh, what's she going to say now? Because I had 46, well, quite a long time. She was my next door neighbor. So you got to know when you're next door neighbors, you know. And I knew everything was going on in their house, and I knew everything was going on in my house, you know. But I got her son, and he was a love, and uh, had him for 40 years. I mean, I, he's had me, well, it, you know what I mean. We've been together for that long. And you, you learn then, you learn that, okay, now wait. Don't get upset, because half the time she said, but it wasn't half as bad as what I thought it would be. But then the other half time, too, it was bad. <laughs> because, <laughs> but I was learning, see. And now I've been through so many stories. I pick up the phone, I never knew if she was going to give me heck or if she's going to give me love. And it was just like, you know, what's going to happen today, this morning? So it really trained me to be ready for whatever the enemy would try to do to me and to see if I could answer back nicely. I mean, I didn't always want to act back next. All right. Thank you, Catherine. That's beautiful. But again, the words you know of your mouth either create life. And if you want to look at the scripture in Proverbs, in her mouth was the law of kindness, or in her tongue. And all her ways were ways of peace. And all her paths were paths of pleasantness. And you know, beauty is deceitful and charm and all that stuff. It's nice to have it, but it don't last. But a woman who fears the Lord, mm. she shall be blessed. Amen. Her children will rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he who sits in the gates with all the guys over there doing their stuff, being there who they are, he will also say she is the best woman of all the good women in the world. She's the best. And you guys, you better tell your wife that. It's after Valentine's Day. You better tell her she's the best. You want to hold on to her? Talk story to her. It's what men see that they like and what women hear that make a difference. Tell her, I love you, honey. I love you, and you're the most beautiful woman in the world. You want to send her and put her on cloud nine, tell her that, and then give her a few hugs. You know, Pastor, as I would sit or stand washing dishes, I had five children, so I was washing dishes all the time. I didn't always have dishwasher, you know. But once I got dishwasher, I had kids at dishwash, you know. But I would be standing peeling potatoes or doing something to think my husband would come up behind me and put his arms around me and give me love, give me a hug. Strength would come into my body, you know, I had to have that, having five children. And I feel good, you know, I feel somebody loves me, you know, besides all these kids yes. hanging onto my skirt and I'd move, it was like a little army moving through as I'd move through the the um, markets, you know. I'd have one hanging on a skirt here, one here, one in the belly. I had three in three years and I was just barefoot and pregnant all my life, okay? It's part of life. And I'm not anymore, and I'm real happy about that. <laughs> all the kids are gone. There's no such thing as an empty nest syndrome for me. I am thrilled to death, thrilled. Uh, it was hard when the first or the last child left. I cried for a, two, a few days, Tina, and then I was hilariously happy that they were all gone, and my husband and I could be all alone and that's all I'm going to say because I got to get over here to my pastor because I could talk forever especially when I get a man of God here I feel so much freedom and I feel so much love from you Sua Pastor Sua our beautiful Assembly of God pastor you 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 pastor the Samoan people in Kaneohe and it's Tawala did I say the right name right no I didn't say it right Tawala pa Tawala. Pastor Sue, good morning to good you. Morning, Praise the Lord. Our lovely Evan Waldemar. Is that right, Evelyn? <laughs> I don't get people's names right. <coughs> Brought you to me. Talk story. <coughs> you talk story. <coughs> How did you have Christian parents? <coughs> well, uh, first of all, I, I appreciate the opportunity and the privilege uh, to be in the program uh, this morning. Uh, I'd like to extend that uh, appreciation and gratitude. Um, I was originally from Samoa, 
and if you want to understand the culture, the Samoans are, are all Christians, or they would consider themselves Christians. They're no atheists. Uh, they, they belong to uh, an organization, uh, religious denominations, but they still call themselves Christians. Yes. Now, that is being religious. It's a tradition. You know, yeah, it's a tradition. Uh, until about uh, 50 years ago, when the, the Pentecostal movement just moved in into Samoa. Really? 50 years ago? And then what happened ago. is it's not being religious now, it's relationship. So they began to uh, preach and teach the word about a relationship with God and not just being routine in religious activities every Sunday, you know, or whatever right. schedule. And so the, the whole uh, emphasis of, uh, of Christianity, of being a Christian, is, is changed. Mm -hmm. And so when I came from Samoa, so my parents were very religious uh, parents. Mm -hmm. If I, they were one of the pillars of the church in our uh, village, and uh, so when I came from Samoa, I was not really, I was still consider myself a professed Christian, but did not have a relationship with Christ. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? And so until, <clears throat> until I met my wife, it was my wife, through my wife, that uh, I came to really know the Lord and accept the Lord in my heart right. and my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Is that right? Yes. Your wife, right. And, uh, and, and it was, you know, she's been trying to get me to the church for, gee, four or five months. <laughs> just invited me that just was to come your to church. That was before we got married. Before you got married. We, we just befriended one another. Uh-huh. And so she's been invited. The only thing that she asked me uh, to do uh, her as a favor is just to come to church. And I've been reluctant all that time. I says, well, you know, I have a church to go to, but... Uh, you know, I'll do anything else, but church, oh, you know, I don't like those Pentecostal churches. He says, I hate those Pentecostal churches, <laughs> you know. So I'll do anything. Yeah. Until after so many months, uh, I felt like I'm, you know, I'm using her. And all she's asking is just, Go to church. just come to church with her. That's well, so all. why did you not like the Pentecostal? Were they too loud or what? Like, well, you know? it's just, it's, it's, it's not uh, as I always used to. I it's, see. Long, it's not a norm for a professed Christian like I am in a congregational church, I you know see. what I'm saying? I see. You go there for an hour just sitting there and sleep and yeah. whatever, you know, and then go home and <laughs> The word's so, just having a form of religion but yes, denying the power. power thereof. And so there's no power. There, I mean, there, you cannot sense the power of God, the presence of God yeah. in there. Yeah. And so to me, that was good enough for me. And all these, yeah, I mean, singing and lifting their hands, that is... <laughs> I thought it was really out of order. Order, yeah. you know. So that's why I really didn't really want to. And so finally, I get to the point. I think God has an appointed time just for me. Uh, finally, I get to the point where I said, "Gee, I'll just to make her feel happy." <laughs> just one time, I told her, "Okay, I'll just come to your church just one time, just one time," not knowing that God is is ready to. I mean, get a hold of my, my life. So I went to church. I was the only visitor in that church in that, uh, that morning. And uh, words, I was sitting between my wife and, and her mother. Yeah, and good. And so I was sandwiched <laughs> in, you know, as, as they began to worship and uh, singing and all clapping their hands. I felt so uncomfortable, but I didn't want to make them feel bad too. So what I did was kind of clap a little bit and saw them lifting their hands. I kind of lift a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit, to make sure that, you know, they're, oh, yeah, yeah. You want to be nice. But what really, what really touched me was uh, when the Word was preached. I always loved the Word, even when I was in a congregational church. I loved the Word to hear it. And I felt like the pastor really knew my life. You know, you have that kind of experience. The pastor really knew the way he preached. It's like he's talking to you. And I felt like, you know, the word is really beginning to pierce my spirit, pierce my heart, pierce my soul. And I began to feel the convictions of the Holy Spirit. My wife did not even explain to me how to accept the Lord. I mean, it's just all that. And I felt so convinced. The power of God was just, you can even sense the presence of the Lord. It was awesome. And so when he gave the, uh, the opportunity for altar call, 
I stood up by myself, just well, I was the only one up there in the altar. <laughs> you were the only visitor. I was the only visitor. I was the only one that accepted the altar call. <laughs> you know. But you were the most important one. Oh yes. That was who the preacher was speaking. The Holy Spirit that's, was speaking directly to that's you. That's right. And, and and God has just sat me. You know. I mean, yeah. it, just sat me that morning, and I accepted the Lord. He, and you know what? From yeah. that day forth, I have never missed one church since. <laughs> And I married my wife uh, a few months later on. Well, he and, knew uh, you while you were yet in your mother's womb. He appointed you to be a pastor and teacher and all those good things. You just didn't know it. Yeah, you know what? Uh, when, when I was growing up, even when I was in high school, I had this best friend of mine. He was saved, but he never witnessed to me. And because, you know, I never do all this stuff, I always be in, a, in the pastor's house, you know, brought up in the, in the pastor's house all of my life even when we were in high school. So we were called, you know, just people and our classmates, they call us pastors. Ah. You know, because the way we dress, the way we, we don't smoke, we don't do those kind of stuff. Right, right. You know, and, and so they just call that pastors. We never realized. In fact, when I graduated, I was going to go to a Bible school, you know, for training in a congregational church. But then I had a scholarship to come here, so I, I offer the first opportunity. I'll take the first opportunity. But not knowing that God has a plan, even for myself here. Yes. I thought I was running away from God, and God sat me right here in a way. <laughs> How long ago was that, Pastor Sewell? Well, that was 1974. Um, See, 74. I came here in 1971. Mm -hmm. uh, I found the Lord in 1974, and ever and since then. And you became a pastor? And your lovely wife, you and Vi, had how many children? Uh, we have four children. Good. Yes, uh, three girls, and our youngest son is uh, nine years old, and our youngest daughter is 13, and then 16, and uh, 19. Well, you understand the heart of the youth then. Oh, yes. Your heart, I can understand how your heart would go out towards the young people. In this day and age, it's very hard for our young people. Mm -hmm. And even in the Samoan culture, isn't it? Because they have been Christians, so-called Christians all their lives, but they really don't understand the Word of God and the commandments of God and that relationship with the Lord, do they? That's right, yes. So you have a vision to take that to our youth? Would you like to talk about that? Yes, uh, I was, I've been working with uh, the youth ministry in our district, the statewide, with the Assemblies of God. I've been working with the youth since 1982 uh, until now. So I, I did not expect, I did not expect to, uh, to take the leadership uh, position until about five, four years ago. Mm -hmm. I was elected into that directorship. And, uh, and my heart really goes out for young people. Yes. My heart goes out for the young people. Because, uh, well, what the Lord has really shown me regarding the young people is they are really sitting on the fence. And we need to reach them, even when they're in high school, in their teens, mm -hmm. to reach them to make the proper and the right choice before they graduated. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the vision, this is the, the, uh, the, 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 the goal that we have. Amen. We really would wanted to reach out to the young people uh, before Sula, they make that uh, choice. Don't you believe it's going down into the grammar school now, though, too, besides just high school, that young people all over the nation in grammar school are involved in drugs and guns and all of these yeah. things, and even sexual activities at 8, 11, and 12, and 13 now. It's no longer in the high school. Mm -hmm. It's gone down into the grammar. And so it's really not too early to start even then. Oh, yeah, I think it's not too early. In fact, that's what we're conscious about that. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 sm the smaller or the younger generations, we need to teach them about God. So when they grow up to be teens, they will be able to, they're far ahead. Yeah. You know? And so there's an emphasis also to teach the Word of God and also the relationship that they can have. Right. Uh, some missionaries are called when they're five years old. Yes. Some missionaries, some people, are, pastors are called when they're seven years old. Yes. So, you know, you're talking about that age yes. where God can still call them, you know, and, and 
run their lives up. Well, isn't it up to us as parents to be that example? You can't tell a kid not to smoke and then sit there with a cigarette in your mouth or to, not to lie and then you lie on the telephone right, about yeah. your taxes or something. It's up to us to live that life, really live it clean and honest before our children too. That's one of the emphasis that we try to, even in our church, I said, you know, you cannot just depend on the church and say, oh, teach my kids. You know, teach the value, God's value of my kids. Yeah. I said, no, 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 the first school is your home. That's you right. teach them. But the thing is, you know, it's like the saying, monkey do, monkey see, monkey do. So what you do will really reflect in the life of the kids, of the, you know, of the young ones. Yes. So we need to live the Word of God even in our lives so that they can see. Because, see, the, 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 the world has a lot of pressures. Yeah. And even the peer pressure among the young people and, and the kids. So they're drawn out. And what we need to do is we need to draw that there is something better yes. for them in the future and even yes. in their lives as they grow yes. up. And this is a, a great responsibility for us as parents yes. to instill those values of godly values in our kids when they, even when they're young. The Bible says that, you know, raise up the kids when they're young. As they grow old, they will never depart from it. And so it's our responsibility right. to instill those values in them. And, and somehow the devil, like you were saying, I mean, that was a good prophecy this morning. Because that's the work of the devil, trying to destroy the family. And yes. if he's able to destroy the family, then he's able to destroy every unit of the family. And the nation. And the country. And the church. Everything. You see. Because, you know, I, I, I always believe that the family is much more important. See, it was the family that God has created first than the church. Correct. That's so correct. If, if he created a family first, then how important the family is because a strong family will have a stronger church. Amen. And a strong church will have a strong nation and a country. Amen. And a community and neighborhood. Pastor, and I found that God is really majoring in on unity. And I had in years past a minister to some of the mixed couples, even if they're Samoan and Haole like me, and sad that I found that sometimes there was prejudice on either side, even in the churches, if the couples were mixed, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was rather sad. I know it happens out in the world, but it shouldn't happen in the church. And that, that this couple did not even want to go to church because there was so much prejudice against one or the other and they made fun of them and all and I thought we've got to get a hold of that in our churches and stop all prejudice anyway anyhow anywhere the unity now in Jesus Christ is very important that's true that's true the unity. yeah I think you know I begin to see you know in spite of what we are seeing in the world and what we feel in the world today I, I sense a strong revival and the Spirit of God is raising up a standard and also is pulling down the, uh, the walls, you know, s that separated, you know, those kind of attitudes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I see more of unity. God is really bringing the church together uh, from different denominations. I see that in, in, even in pastors. More and more pastors of different denominations are coming together to, to, uh, to, pray together for a few days. In fact, uh, it was last month they had uh, yeah. a pastor's uh, prayer re uh, retreat. Yeah, they had about a hundred of them. This very morning right now, there yes. are a few pastors meeting together. My pastor, Steve Johnson, is connected into, into this. And I believe that's the next thing. When the pastors come together in unity and love and let the denominational walls and our differences fall down, then revival can come to the city. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends on the leaders. The leaders will have to take that lead. See, if the people will see that the pastors are in unity, then they'll just follow. That's right. You know, the sheep That's will just right. follow the shepherd. That's right. But if, if you separate yourself, isolated yourself as a pastor, yeah. then it, the whole spirit will dwindle down to the whole congregation yeah. and say, well, we don't want to be a part of it. Our pastor yeah. is not a part involved. So we really need to bring yeah. together. And I, and I see that slowly and, and surely God is bringing the body of Christ together. Yeah. And so even regarding the youth, uh, this convention that we, we're, we're having a convention next week. This is for a statewide convention. 
uh, for youth every year, you know, for so many, many, many years. That's March 27th <coughs> to the 31st. To the 31st. 1995 Youth Convention. It's up there on the board. And it's very, very reasonable, the registration fee. Yes. A uh, young person can pray, God, bring that amount in. And God will, because it's important that that yearning and that desire in that young person's heart that they get there to that youth conference. What happens there now, Pastor? Well, you know, it's a, it's a youth convention where uh, Dave, uh, Reverend Dave Reaver, who is an evangelist, uh, uh -huh. an ordained minister of the Assemblies of God, and uh, their ministry is to reach out to all the high schools. They, they go out to all the high schools. Probably he'll be here next week right, to explain their ministry. Right, on heart. And so that, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Me I'm too. excited about the, the convention. <laughs> We're expecting about, so far we have about 600 kids. Wow. Young people. And they come and they stay at the hotel. And they stay at the hotel. They will have sessions in the morning, seminar sessions in the morning, just addressing issues that pertains to them. And, um, and also we have evening rallies, so all the right. kids are staying there. And but not the, just Assembly of God. Yeah. This is for all the kids. Yeah, this is what I'm saying because in, in years past, it, it was uh, very inclusive. And, uh, and uh, now we, we're, we're including every, you know, including every, every other denominations or every Thank union God. group. I'm so glad. we're kind of be opening that door yeah. little yeah. by little. Good. And so we're, Good. in fact, we have... Uh, some non Assembly of God, uh, Assembly of God churches, uh, groups. Well, that that's are there. great. That's you know what I'm great. saying? It's because yeah. I think our vision, God is concerned for, the, for all the youth, not just one particular group. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Church, yeah. and, and, and so our vision is to, to mobilize our young people that they can take a stand for God. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, they can take a stand for anything. Yes. And, you know, like I was reading this uh, Baby Busters. Man, this is a good book. It's really good book. Turn it around uh, so they can see it. Who is it by? Uh, by um, George. George Barna. Barna. And I was sharing a little bit with uh, with Catherine, and Catherine says, "What is Baby Busters? Do they sled them, or do they whack them, or <laughs> what?" I said, "No, Baby Busters is name of a generation from 1964 to 1983. So all those kids were born between those uh, years were called Baby Busters." It's because those are the offsprings of the baby boomers. Ah, oh, okay. Baby right. boomers, baby busters. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, got a new one now. Yeah, the baby boomers and the baby <laughs> busters. It, 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 well, it got the, the, the name because there was a baby, uh, the birth bust during that, that time of the year. I mean, there were more uh, babies born uh, during that, between those years than the baby boomers. I see. So that's what they call baby busters. I mean, it was just. Oh. All the baby, you know, yeah. were born for so many, but then that new generation, that generations have a different values. A I lot of them didn't have Sunday school even. Yes, they let, didn't even know Sunday school like the old timers did. Uh, let, let, I don't know. Let me share, just uh, read a little bit here. Like uh, baby busters are determined to reshape the nation's prevailing value systems. Now wait a minute. They're determined to shake the nation's to sh reshape, reshape it. The nation's, the nation's prevailing system. value system. They don't like what the values are now, so they, they want to. They're very make independent. They are. They, their their goal is to change the value system. This is why it's difficult, and this is why our desire more and more to reach out to the young people, so that they can have the same values, the godly values, that will never change. But see. Uh, the the generations that we have of young people right now, right. they're very rebellious. Right. School, the prayer was own. out of school, so yes. they didn't get that that one wonderful thing of prayer. You know, it's a uh, there's some there's some f facts here. It's, well, it says uh, the terminology: seniors were born in 1926 and earlier, and then the the builders were born 1927 to 1945, and then the boomers. 1946 to 1964. Well, go back into 45. I was born in 35, 1935. So Builders. We're, I'm a builder. Yes. Okay, that's good. Those like are the that. ones that really built up the country, built with values and morals. You know, that's why they call she's builders. A, she's a <clears throat> senior, so she's 74. What is she? Um, seniors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a boomer. You're a boomer. I'm a boomer. You're a baby boomer. Yeah. Uh, I'm a baby builder. Yes. You're, you're oh, I sure was. 
<laughs> Why did I ever? And then the Busters were born 1965 to 1983. 65 to 83, okay. So 83... Uh, Right now, those are from, from 1965, those generations. Yeah. Are they going back to traditional <coughs> values and morals? They want to get married? They want to have families? Is that what we're saying or not? No, well, these are, they are ambitious, but their ambitions are personal, not corporate. For self? These are busters, yes. They are, non, they are more individualistic, exhibiting little interest in teamwork or cooperative efforts. These are the you know, the characteristics of the busters. They are uncooperative with authority. They feel a need to make their own decisions, but to leave the consequences of those decisions with the company. Loyalty is not in the vocabulary. It is an all for one and one for me strategy. That is the attitude. You see why it's, it's very, very, very important and for us to, to really reach the, these generations. Well, a lot of the people, Pastor, these people were disappointed in their parents, upset. They talk about, oh, I had a dysfunctional family, blah, 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 blah. They're not proud of what some of the good things, you know, did happen in families. All you hear about is dysfunction. Every family's been dysfunctional. If you want to come right down to it, without Christ, even with the Lord, you That's can be right. dysfunctional. And but to stand around and talk about it, hey, get up and out and go and do God's thing and get up and out of yesterday's woes. Don't hang back in there and complain. Have Jesus heal them. Forgive your mother, your father for whatever they did to you or yes, your uncle yes. or your auntie or the abuse or the incest or whatever it was. Forgive them and get on with life and let Jesus Christ heal that thing and mm -hmm. go on and help other people who need healing in that same area. Because they're all over the world. That's right. Hurting people. Well, we have seen that even in uh, our, our young people, our youth. Yeah. Uh, we had conventions yeah. in the past and rallies in the past. Yeah. Uh, we have seen kids that were coming into the convention try to commit suicide because they're, they have no hope. And then God has delivered them. And this is why this whole ministry is very, very important. Because, if, like you said, this is the future of the yeah. church. Yeah. Should the Lord tarry His coming, these are the future. We're going to be gone. But yeah. we need to raise them up right. to be godly people that they can continue on the ministry uh, of the Lord. Right. And, and they're going to be such powerful godly people, Pastor. Oh, yes. I mean, they're going to have power like we never had. Yes, they have the excitement that we don't have. But so all, it's just a matter of turning them around in the proper and the right way yeah. Yeah. that they will use their enthusiasm and their yeah. excitement yeah. for the Lord, for the glory of God. Yeah. And, and the self-esteem comes back, too. Yes, yes. They've had so low self-esteem because of their parents. You know, Pastor, I was driving across one day, and I was thinking about all of the hurts of, in the human heart, all that's going on, adultery, murder, hate, incest, all the things. And I said, Lord, I don't even know how to counsel people anymore. There's so many things hurting in their lives. The children are hurting from divorce, blah, 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 blah. He said, give them Jesus. Yes. Give them Jesus. And you know, as we give the, the, the Lord Jesus and we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us how to console each and every one is so different. You know, why yeah. this one went into homosexuality? Why that one went into lesbianism? Why that one went That's off right. into yeah. alcoholism? Why? They're not all the same. They've all been hurt. Our youth have been hurt. And the Holy Spirit will show us as older folks how to tenderly and gently take them and pull them out of their addictions. There was a man of God on television. He was talking about, he's about the same size as you. And he was talking about how he couldn't reach these two teenage youths. He wanted to talk to them so bad. He had them on the platform. And he could see that the words he was speaking were going right past them. They weren't listening. It wasn't going into them. He got down on his knees. And he began to weep right in front of those two lads. And he wanted to tell them how much he loved them. And his act of humility, being this big, tall man like you mm. are, his act of humility, kneeling before those two boys in front of the whole crowd, Praise it God. broke their hearts. Mm. They melted, and he re they received Christ. See, there's something about big, strong men who are tender and humble and loving and kind that that show the youth, you know, this guy's tough and he's strong. 
but he's also tender, like Jesus. Yeah, I think that's one of the attributes of the, the kids right now, or the generations uh, of young people right now, is they can tell the truth, and they can tell it's a fake. A phony. A phony. And this is why our, when we minister to them, we really need to minister to them out of love. I mean, they need to know. Yeah. And even by touching them and not just say, hey, yeah. come on, you know, he's, uh, accept the Lord and, you know, and then he'll do all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Not just the preaching, but really showing the compassion and the love yeah. for them. That is what they're looking for. Yeah. And then a program, do you follow up now with the kids? You know, a lot of evangelists come in here, get them off, saved and off of the beach. And the minute the evangelist leaves, they're back on the beach again. So you have to get your fruit to remain. Yes. How do you do that? Yes. Well, this is what we encourage because the kids are coming from all, uh, all over the islands. Yeah. So they come from Kauai, the big island, Maui, all over on Oahu oh, for this convention. And uh, so when they come together, we're trying to encourage right. even the leaders to follow through and have a, a fellowship time to follow right. through on this. Yeah. So we're also encouraging the young people. Somehow, you know, it's like a peak for them when they come to the convention. I know. They're so hyped up with yeah. God and filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're just going out uh, uh, and, and witnessing, telling their friends. Right. And so I said, we, we try to encourage them and yeah. disciple them. Good. You know, th this is uh, it's very important, discipleship. The, uh, also, we like to encourage the, the leaders and also, the, I think, the message that I believe in my heart. Uh, yeah. It's good to, to, to bring in the kids to the church. Let them be excited about God. You know, their emotions is so high. Right. But also we should not ignore the, the message of purity, yeah. sanctification through yeah. the power of the yeah. Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because I've seen a lot of kids, yeah. even in the churches today, yeah. you know, they belong to a church, they're excited about all the activities that they do, but yet they're still living. In the sin. In the sinful life. In they don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Pastor, there's some person out there right now, could be a youth, it could be a person our age that you need to talk to. Just look into that and talk story to them and, and bring them to the Lord. Amen. Well, you know, if uh, there's anyone here that is watching the program, especially the young people, I think there is only one hope. Uh, life seems to be very rude to uh, two young people, to these uh, generations of teens. Uh, the devil, like the prophecy uh, that uh, Phyllis uh, uh, stated that in the, in the beginning of the program, that the devil's job is, is come to destroy, steal, and kill, and even the young, the young generations of young people. And uh, there is no hope to them, most of them, are committing, resulting in committing suicide, it's because they have no hope. They have no sense of value for living. Uh, they have no value for life anymore. They're involved in all these things. Why? Because they have no hope for it. But let me encourage you. There is hope, there is faith, and there is an answer to all of this. And that is only through Jesus Christ. You know, you can come to Christ. You know, He died for us. He died for you. He sacrificed his life for all the young people, you know, and he loves us so much. He loves you, young people. He loves you. If you are hurting yourself, even out there uh, watching the program, if you are hurting, only Jesus can satisfy your hurt. Only he can heal your hurt. And, you know, you, you can never say that the Coke is sweet until you try it. And I'm saying and encouraging you that you can try Jesus, put him in your life, invite him to come into your life and let him change your life and you will have a, per, a new perspective in life. You will have life that is so meaningful because Christ is the author of life. He is a creator of life. He's a creator of all of us. And you know what? He loves us so much that even he gave us himself for you just so that you can have the enjoy and, and the joy of life, not only here in this earth, but have it more in, in, in eternal life, Amen. in heaven, just to be in His presence. There will be no darkness, there will be no death, no crying, no drugs, no, no pimps, I mean nobody else. Amen. But you know what? But the righteousness of God. So if you are out there, if your life is not really, you're not so sure, you are confused, why don't you allow Christ to be in your life today? Accept Him as your Lord and Savior, and you will, you will find peace 
in your heart, for he is the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. And Pastor, Hallelujah. there are no wimps in God. No wimps. The men are <laughs> men, and the women are women. Yes. Grandmothers, mothers, don't give up on your kids. Pray for this youth convention. Send them there. We grandmothers need to sponsor that and get our kids in and say, okay, here, honey, here's the money. Go. Go on the 27th. Go be with those men of God. Let them find a place in their life where they can be with strong men of God and make those men their heroes. Amen. Grandmother's prayers and mother's prayers really count. He really, even after they're gone to heaven, those prayers God will answer. You know, the Lord is so gracious and, and he's so good. Don't give up. Don't give up on anybody. Even those who you think are not going to make heaven, don't give up. Continue right. to ask God mm. to save them, to heal yes. them, to deliver them, to bring them into heaven. As you forgive others, you are forgiven. You know, when I hold grudge in my heart, God holds back forgiveness to me. It says, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us or hurt us. So I have to forgive those who hurt me. And then I have to ask those to forgive me who I have hurt. And God forgive me for not being that Christian that I know I should be. And draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. And we're drawing near to the end of the show. And mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Pastor Sue, oh, for a beautiful much, word. Phyllis. Have thank a you. wonderful convention <laughs> with our youth. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Bless the yes, Samoan, Lord. darling Samoan people. And goodbye, Catherine. Thank you so much for your miracle of day. I'm glad you're well yes. and feeling better. Yes, and yes. thank you, my lovely Evan, today. Waldemar, she's our, our guest in our audience. And thank you for coming. And thank you, crew. Whatever you do, put God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things that you need will be added to you and me. We love you. Don't forget God loves you and will deliver you out of all of your problems. For the righteous cry, the Lord hears, and he delivers them out of all of their problems. Amen? Amen. Amen. We love you. Bye-bye.